Squid Game, a South Korean production, has captured the world's attention. And it tackles one of the intractable challenges of our time, rising economic inequality. Which begs the question, what does it look like when writers' rooms in the United States tackle income inequality? The stories we watch shape our sense of how the world works. Stories bring to life the values that impact our lives, communities, and public policies. So we set out to understand what storylines dominate portrayals of income disparities in the United States. We analyzed 105 television episodes from the fall 2017 to spring 2018 TV season. Here are the top five things we think US TV shows have to learn about income inequality. On TVs across the US, the human impact of income inequality is told in one-off stories, if at all. They didn't give us financial aid. What do you mean? They must have. Then how is Sue back in school? I paid for it. <laughs> With what? We have like $8 in checking. We don't even have enough to buy more checks. I sold my half of the diaper business. Characters might lack means at a given moment in time, but they generally don't face impossible choices. The consequence of this creative decision is that we often see low-income challenges on TV as surmountable. I can get Ian's bail money. We don't see an honest reckoning with the seemingly inescapable nature of systemic economic inequality. Escaping poverty is almost never a theme in US TV shows. In the episodes we watch, characters' lack of income really became a serious problem when they needed healthcare. Are you sure you should be putting super glue on ah. an open wound? Hmm? Yeah, probably. Shows like Superstore borrow from real stories of employee-sponsored charity drives. And while we do see the gruesome consequences of people without health insurance, we don't sense that families like the Gallaghers are chronically hungry or facing imminent threats of eviction. When shows do feature low-income challenges, the majority of the characters represented are white. These characters are giving more depth than their BIPOC co-stars. We know more about who they are, their motivations, and their flaws. I had a little crush on Amy there. I said it. Okay. Alcohol was created to distract us from existential dread. Families like the Gallaghers combine dads who fell in hard times with children who drew a bad lot. And even when BIPOC characters feature prominently, they apparently just work at box stores. And I think he's a real dummy, a class A stinker. What do you say, mother? Regardless of whether white or BIPOC characters drive the story, it's their flaws, not the societal ones, that landed them on hard times. You sure you know what you're doing? I found loopholes in the system. I skirted the man. I sent a big F you to society. Cultural poverty narratives have long dominated both social science research and political debates. In popular media, we see characters struggle because of poor decisions. They lack ambition or face addiction. It's the fault of the individual rather than the design of a system. So you not only gambled away all of our money, but also Regina's. Okay. It also works in the inverse. We're told successful characters arrived where they are thanks to their strengths. Currently, I'm attempting to solve the Penrose Conjecture. I'm composing my Nobel acceptance speech for when I've solved the Penrose Conjecture. Culture of poverty narratives profoundly shape public policy. They shook policymakers from taking accountability for their roles in drafting discriminatory laws. They shield the wealthy from paying their fair share. And they obfuscate the explicit interest those at the top have in keeping others down, unable to break free from cycles of poverty. There's a lot of money in Memphis, and there's a lot of poverty. But perhaps the most striking pattern we notice is that most shows dealing with low-income challenges fall into one genre, comedy. They feature people making the best of hopeless situations, resorting to crafty, often illegal, means to make money. I'm sorry, Mr. Wessels. It says here you're already collecting your benefit. Um, Mr. Ramirez? It says here you're dead. TV shows in the United States display misfortune for our entertainment. We laugh with the characters. What could be better than a donut and a cup of coffee? 
Health insurance, paid sick days, a raise. Their ventures aim to make us feel optimistic about the goodness and resilience of the human spirit. You solved healthcare! That's where Squid Game differs. Its brilliance lies in the absurdity of the plot. The irony of layering children's games with life or death stakes. The symbolism of people, numbers, fighting to escape the games while those who hold the power to stop it, just watch. If you're a showrunner, advocate, or fan wondering whether there's a better way, wondering if people have the appetite for shows that deal seriously with income inequality, Squid Game suggests we're hungry for it. We want stories with nuance and diverse protagonists who show us what it looks like to care for one another. Protagonists who challenge power. Stories where everyone wins. Our analysis is the latest in a growing body of research for why experts with lived experience should be in writers' rooms. Our report is also a roadmap for how fandoms and advocates can shift dominant narratives online. Whether you work in Hollywood or organizing, we all share responsibility to rewrite the script on how to care for one another. Improving low-income representation on television can shift public will towards eradicating poverty. We can write scripts that envision a world with more economic opportunity. We can write laws that support a culture of care and invest equitably in communities. A little paragraph, a life-changing one for millions of families. Thousands of dollars for a child tax credit in 2021. Neither parent has paid family and medical leave. Every family in America is like one emergency away from a crisis. If you want to learn more about this research, subscribe to our channel or visit our website.